This is a, uh, it's a, a large collaboration of people with a variety of expertise. So we have AGN accretion disk simulator, simulators uh, working with numerical relativists and new, working with post-Newtonian theorists. And so what we're trying to do is do something kind of novel where we're trying to model now AGN, supermassive, bl binary, uh, super, supermassive black holes that are accreting either in a binary situation or with a tidal disruption. Okay, so these are both uh, things that are going to be explored with transient surveys and also with multi-messenger surveys like uh, with gravitational wave uh, observatories in the future. And so that's where the marriage between numerical relativity and astrophysics comes. And so uh, this, was, uh, this was started in an in a earlier PRAC project, and now we've, uh, um, we're moving to a new PRAC project that we started just this past year. So we're going to be communicating results that are in progress and some from that were continued from uh, the previous PRAC. So these are the papers in progress. Uh, m most of them are. So we're really excited, just as the NSF is, uh, about multi-messenger astronomy. So we're really excited about uh, looking at astrophysics in the gravitational wave regime. And so uh, we're talking about supermassive black holes, so things that are low frequency gravitational wave emitters. So these are d detectable by uh, either um, ELISA or NGO in the, fu in the, in the future or by uh, pulsar timing arrays that are currently going on uh, but are expected to, to actually see uh, sources in the next few years. So right now we're also trying to, for a while we were trying to beat out the, the first uh, gravitational wave detection. We wanted to actually nail down a pretty direct evidence of an inspiraling binary black hole system. And we wanted to do this using electromagnetic waves. So we wanted to do the simulation, predict the signal, and then uh, observe it uh, in, in with the, these uh, electromagnetic surveys. Um, unfortunately, uh, we did not beat the detection. Um, we're, we're actually happy to say. Um, but uh, we're still trying to nail down the electromagnetic prediction so that we can uh, provide a theoretical understanding of that orthogonal basis of information. So the gravitational wave content uh, tells us about the gra what, what's really the, gr the strong gravitational source, where, about the space-time geometry, but the, the electromagnetic emission tells us about the matter, and it, it probes the space-time in a different way. So these two modes of information can then constrain our theor theoretical models in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a tighter fashion. And uh, these are also really exciting things to just explore. You know, you throw gas onto black holes, one or two of them, and really exciting things happen. We're really excited about doing that. So, so we're focusing on two events that are particularly exciting and because we're learning about them in these transient surveys. In these high cadence all sky surveys, we're, we're, we found evidence that of, of really close in spiraling supermassive black hole binaries. And we're also seeing tidal disruption events. So the, we're, we're finding strong evidence for, the, for these, and so, but we don't really have a very good theoretical understanding because these are challenging numerical calculations that need to be done. You need to, to do resolved MHD simulations on a dynamical space-time in, in the case of uh, supermassive binary black holes, and, and in case of tidal disruption events, you need to resolve the star as it transits near the, the supermassive black hole and you need to resolve the MHD turbulence that then ensues as it uh, forms a debris disk uh, that then accretes uh, back onto the black hole. And both of them, actually this one also involves a dynamical space time because there are two uh, gravity regimes. There's the local gravity of the star that we have to model, and then there's the, this background metric, background space time of the black hole that we have to handle. So we have to handle both of those uh, gravity regimes at once. And we want, to ex we want to do this for a number of reasons. We want to understand how uh, black hole feedback happens. We want to understand how accretion starts. So tidal disruption events are really tell us about how really boring black holes become active and become exciting. 
And so that, that is particularly a regime that we, we, we know nothing about. And so these events help us understand these better. So yeah, so, we're, so this really excited us. So we weren't expecting two black holes to merge. I, I'm, I, I hope everyone has, has seen this before. Raise, raise, I want to embarrass, who hasn't seen this movie before? OK, very good, good. So, so we were really excited. You know, I grew up with gravitational waves. Uh, I started at Caltech as an undergrad the year after they received NSF funding. So I've seen LIGO talks forever. And, but you know, there's this little like, voice in my head uh, that doesn't really quite believe gravitational waves exist, OK? So even I, I'm, in the, I'm in this field, I have to admit, you know, I wasn't 100% that we could actually do it. But seeing and hearing it, it made me a, a renewed uh, believer. So uh, I'm really excited about the, the prospects of gra doing gravitational wave astronomy. OK, so detecting gravitational waves was exciting enough. Then LISA Pathfinder launched. Everyone had their fingers crossed. They just released their, their, their first science results. And they they've, uh, told us that, yes, they can do it. They can, once the full ELISA program launches and is in, uh, in uh, progress, they, they, in, 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 uh, in action, they can actually reach the theoretical uh, pr uh, predictive limits that they had in their science plan. So, so, so they've proven the technology, and so this is potentially going to hasten the development of their of their technology for, to launch the full LISA or ELISA observatory. And so we'll be able to listen on the low frequency band of gravitational waves so sooner, I hope, than later. So. So this is just a, a, a summary of what we're doing or what we've done in the near, uh, the near recent uh, past. Um, so this is a list of simulations that we've done. So we're looking at, we want to understand how the model parameters affect the electromagnetic emissions. So plasmas accrete onto the black holes. They heat up. They shine brightly. And this light is what we detect. So we have to model that process. And, but we need to see, understand how our model parameters affect that electromagnetic output. So uh, the, the key uh, ob observed, uh, we're, we're primarily interested in modeling the, the, the light curve of the b binary because the prospects of observing these, uh, spatially resolving these is, is, is low. So we, we're really interested in the time domain. So um, we're after uh, periodic signals that can be connected to model parameters so that we can understand, we can make constraints on what we're actually seeing and when, we, when we compare it to observational data. So we're trying to understand that by doing a uh, mass ratio survey. So we did a mass ratio survey of the binary black holes. We did, we're understanding what sorts of magnetic fields are required uh, to give rise to this electromagnetic signal. We're looking at also binaries that are at different separations because these are binaries that have started in different, so these are black holes that have started in different galaxies, been captured through a galactic merger event and then in spiraled over uh, millions, billions of years, and then finally are tight enough that they, they're they're building a circumbinary environment. And so this is the circumbinary disk that we're, um, we're looking at. And um, these are little mini disks that follow each black hole. So before, our earliest runs were, were just focused on the, the disk uh, around the binary itself and not on the fluid closest to the black holes. But now we've, we've developed a scheme. Uh, Dennis Bowen, a grad student at RIT, is leading the, this effort where we, we put little mini disks around the black holes so we can start closer to the uh, expected uh, quasi-steady state that, that the system will uh, naturally evolve to. So, so we've developed uh, a procedure to do that, and we're studying how the, these disks are tidally truncated a, as a function of the separation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then also, 
We're, we're doing the first tidal disruption events with our new multi-patch scheme that allows us to resolve the star and the black hole uh, space-time geometry um, at once. So I'll, I'll be talking about that too. So the key challenges, um, I represented the, uh, the dynamical range of our problem by the dynamical font size on this plot on this graph, so, so I apologize for the, the small font size. So I, I just want to say that there are large space scales and then there are also large time scales that we have to resolve. So we're, we end up running with uh, about uh, you know, 10 million cells marching out to 10 million time steps. We have to resolve the black holes. So they're, they set a, uh, the the time and spatial scale limit that we have to resolve. But then we have to, we have to evolve these disks long enough so that the turbulence, the weak magnetic field builds up, um, starts the magnetorotational instability, allows for angular momentum to be export, transported from the inner part of the disk to the outer part of the disk so that matter is accreted. And we want the turbulence to grow and and mature long enough so that it's in a nice statistically kind of random turbulent state so that we can make a connection to reality in a more successful fashion. So uh, that means that we need to run long and, and we have to run with a small time step. Okay, so that is computationally challenging. We're also developing new techniques. So this multi-patch technique, which is like running with running multiple uh, accretion disk simulations at once that are kind of married together, marched in, in time together. And so we're, we're multiplying the, the effort that, is, that really needs to be um, uh, the, the amount of computational uh, load that, that, uh, that these multi-patch systems uh, require. So, um, so that's why we need blue waters. We need the the SUs. We need uh, the also the the flexibility to test these the, this new infrastructure at the at such a large scale. So and uh, the 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 expertise of the blue waters people we've we've also benefited a great deal, and we'll talk about that later too. So so this is an example. So this is our uh, our, our simulation that we that we used to arrive at a, uh, that we found a, an interesting uh, periodic signal from that we, we hoped we could be used to, to discover these, these systems in space. And it, it was a pretty lar large simulation that we ran on Ranger. Um, but after studying it more, we, we feared that maybe it was losing uh, magnetic field strength. So eventually, the, the periodic signal actually came from this little over-density region that formed in the inner edge of the disk that, uh, that was uh, uh, periodically uh, uh, perturbed by the bi binary. So material would be tidally stripped off of the inner edge. It would uh, be drawn to the binary, but then it would be relaunched, and, it, and that material, that launch uh, from the binary would would slam up against this lump and then create that bright signal after the, the shock heated it up. So we, we found that if we increase the size of the disk, so we had more mass and more magnetic field there to accrete for longer, we found that this, this lump actually didn't develop as strong. So here, this is the original run. This is where the, the development of the lump that creates this, this, this really obvious periodic signal and we found that with, uh, with more magnetic field present, the, there were stronger magnetic stresses that ripped apart that, that lump. And so it, it didn't allow the, for the lump to develop as, as well. So we, we, think, we think we've discovered a, a mechanism that a disk could, could turn on a periodic signal. So for instance, the magnetic field could be dissipated uh, 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 for a period of time for whatever reason. And then another, and so then a lump could develop, and then um, uh, another annulus of magnetic field could be accreted, and that lump would then be sheared apart and dissipated, and so that periodic signal would, would decay. So we're, we're undercovering some physical situation that could give rise to the, this evolving 
uh, periodic uh, electromagnetic signal. So uh, this other, uh, so this was the run with the bigger disk. So Blue Waters allowed us to run uh, with, with a larger disk with more cells. Uh, but we also injected artificially more poloidal ordered magnetic field. And that ordered magnetic field then uh, enhanced the magnetic field stress. And then that uh, also dissipated the lump. So um, if you actually look at the, the light curve and then you take a Fourier transform, you can you can look at what uh, frequencies are, are the dominant source of uh, variability. And in the original run, this, this quasi-periodic oscillation was really obvious. And so we were really excited by it. By it. Uh, we, we, we still are. Um, the, the, the bigger disk run and the flux injected run had less period periodicity. Um, uh, at that characteristic wavelength, but there's still uh, lots of variability. So this, the, if, you, if you plotted this on a log-log curve, you would get a nice uh, decaying uh, power law, kind of characteristic of um, the chaotic uh, fluctuations that you see in AGN light curves. So it's, it's as if it's a, just a single black hole accretion disk. Um, but uh, the, even in the flux injected case, you still see, though, strong signals at, at, the, at this 1.5 omega bin um, uh, period. So omega bin is the uh, bi binary's period. It's a period of the binary's orbit. So um, the uh, other project that we were focused on is, is exploring how many disks evolve and how they're tidally truncated. So there was a lot of work done in Newtonian gravity on exactly what radius do, are these mini disks truncated at. This is particularly interesting because uh, there's been recent theoretical work uh, predicting that most of the light is actually going to come from the accretion stream from the circumbinary disk that surrounds the mini disks uh, slamming onto these mini disks. So that, that region is going to be x-ray bright. and this, this, this material out here is going to be very sparse. So it's going to allow you to see that innermost region better. And so, so it's really the dynamics of the mini disks that are going to be really important for predicting the, the total uh, bolometric light curve of, of these systems. So uh, we've, in the post-Newtonian regime, we've, predict, we've studied this tidal truncation problem. So we've found that, indeed, a, if at separations of about 100 m or 100 black hole radii, the Newtonian predictions for where the radii uh, of truncation is still consistent with uh, Newtonian prediction. But then as you decrease that separation, you get more and more into the relativistic regime. The velocities of the binary uh, uh, get faster, get closer to the speed of light. And so you're, you're entering more the relativistic re regime. And around separations about 16m or 16 black hole radii, you, you transition into the relativistic regime. So you can no longer use a Newtonian uh, uh, model of gravity uh, for separations smaller than that, which seems, at least for the sake of the tidal truncation um, measurement, is, is very reasonable. So. So this was the first me measurement of that truncation radius in the relativistic regime. And we're also, we also did this as initial data for our future simulations. So we're now using this initial data, data procedure to, to evolve uh, 3D MHD simulations. And those are currently underway. So I mentioned we, we've developed this multi-patch system to cover uh, the different the varieties of spatial scales that we need to resolve. And this is a blow up of this little inner, inner part. So this is the star that's been tidally disrupted. This is the tidal tail of material that falls back onto the black hole. And this inner region uh, has, uh, so the star, this inner square, covered the, the, the entirety of the star. And so as it's been disrupted, it's moving out of that box. But initially, it was entirely covered. And you can see that it's locally Cartesian, okay, that, that stellar patch. And then it, it lives on this, on the black holes patch, which is spherical. So we, we 
are able to evolve systems with different resolutions, obviously, but also different topologies that conform to the symmetries of the underlying physics. So this allows us to optimize the runtime performance at a, uh, for a given cell count because you now are taking advantage of the symmetries of, of, the, of, the, of the physics that, that you're evolving. So this, this multi-patch system allows you to run with different coordinates. It also allows you to now, uh, we've added uh, heterogeneous time stepping. So one can time step faster uh, than the other without um, having the, 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 the slower one uh, repeat time steps. And we can also do physics differently. So we actually use a multi-process, multi-data model. So we can, you can run different ex executables to do different physics in the different patches. And we actually, in this tidal disruption case, we actually do. We solve Poisson's equation in this local stellar patch, but we don't solve any gravity equations really in the, in the global patch because we know the, the solution for a single black hole spacetime. So that, that's, that's static. That gravity is, that, those, those metric terms are static. Uh, but these metric terms change because we have to capture the self-gravity of the star. And, oh, uh, the product. So we, we actually, you know, this, this code is being written uh, agnostic to the underlying fluid or MHD algorithms uh, being used so that we can maybe use the multi-patch system with other codes like uh, Athena, for instance, or what, what, what have you. So we're entering a regime where we're, we're, going, to be ha we're going to be putting different accreting, hydrodynamically interesting uh, problems, and we're going to be mashing them up together, okay? So, so the, this patchwork system allows us to do that. And this is a test. Uh, it's a spherical blast wave. So we've got this, sphere, this global spherical patch uh, with some Cartesian plat patches uh, thrown in there. And the spherical blast wave it conforms to the spherical geometry, but also, uh, but not to the Cartesian one. So we, this just demonstrates that the, the blast wave goes through the different patches uh, nicely. Uh, if you deal with spherical grids, you know that the, uh, the, cor the origin is a source of problems because it's a coordinate singularity. So you can't evolve a, a slab symmetric shock through the origin. It'll act as if it's, if it's a flagpole and wind going past it. It'll, it'll act like a, um, as, um, as an obstacle. Uh, but with a Cartesian patch in there that masks that, that coordinate singularity, we can evolve nicely through it. And um, so we've, we've demonstrated this in a number of hydrodynamic scenarios, and now we're working towards um, moving this to the MHD regime. And uh, we'll be using it also for the circumbinary disk problem, so uh, where we're having binary black holes. So you imagine around each black hole, you have a different patch, okay? And then the, each of those patches lives on a, a larger global patch where the circumbinary disk evolves. We're also working on, so with all these patches, all this heterogeneous time stepping, it's very complicated to balance the load. So we're working with a, um, a uh, Sanjay Kale's group at University of Illinois um, as a, a paid project on how to handle this, this load balancing problem. Right now, actually, our, our load is not balanced very well because uh, we're, we're solving Einstein's equation approximately using different techniques depending upon your proximity to the black holes. And so uh, the load, it, the local load is, is, is higher near the black holes. And so we need to parcel out uh, distribute the cells in a heterogeneous fashion. Um, and so um, we're, we're thinking, well, charm plus plus would solve our, all of our problems, but it may take a lot of effort to uh, recode our simulation code into the charm plus plus language. So we're exploring, maybe, maybe we can meet, meet charm halfway and use AMPI um, to just retool harm, which is our the name of our code. And um, um, so we're exploring these different strategies. Uh, first, we're probably going to just try their new load balancing library, see how much that, that gains us. But that's not going to solve 
the problems that we're going to have with the multi-patch. I think we're going to have to go to a more sophisticated uh, strategy. And we've just gotten the green light on this project, so we, haven't, we don't have much to show yet, uh, but we're going to be very active on it in the next year. We're also w working with uh, Mac Van Moore and, and Robert um, on how to best uh, visualize these, uh, our simulations. So we haven't, we, you know, we've, we've been kind of slow to um, really develop vi good visualization tools. Uh, we've been using IDL a lot. Um, so uh, we've been working more with Visit, uh, but we still need to learn how to best visualize magnetic uh, field lines, how to best volume render the density, and also see the field lines at once. And so we're, 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 we're discovering that we probably have to do this in parallel. So we have to decompose the data and then parallel process it with Visit. And we, we need to explore how the time evolution of the field lines can, can be done in a smooth fashion so that you can have maintain field line integrity as you march forward in time. So th these, uh, this is a work in progress, but we're, we're really excited about this. And this is really what Blue Waters also has to offer. It has SUs, but it has all these great people that can really give you these wonderful scientific products. And so in conclusion, uh, we have mechanisms for electromagnetic periodic signals of circumbinary disks. We're exploring how the model parameters affect that. And we're also demonstrating new technologies that we hope to use to explore new, new problems, but also these existing problems in a more sophisticated fashion. And uh, I won't repeat what I just said here uh, with respect to the paid program and the visualization, but we're really excited and we're very uh, grateful for, for our uh, opportunity to work with Blue Waters. So thank you very much.